of the pain. You don't care as much. So endorphin is also released as one of the chemicals around orgasm, too. Norepinephrine, the fight or flight response, also known as noradrenaline, closely related to adrenaline. It uh, basically activates, activates the fight or flight response in terms of uh, arousal. Acetylcholine, it's both inhibitory and excitatory, excitatory if you will. Uh, it's a neurotransmitter, so cholines, all cholines are basically involved with uh, interface between nerves and muscles. They're, so they're off, cholines are often involved with movement. Anandamide uh, basically is a neurotransmitter that is involved with pain, coordination, memory, and other physical sensations. Anandamide. Phenylethylamine, beta phenylethylamine, that butterflies and stomach uh, feeling uh, that you get when you're falling in love. Testosterone, sex characteristics in both sexes. Estrogen, sex characteristics in both sexes. Uh, GABA, uh, which I mentioned before, which basically has deals with general arousal within uh, the brain in particular. So those neurochemicals have their analogs in drug substances. So for example, serotonin is acted upon or um, affected by LSD, mushrooms, certain SSRIs like Prozac, Paxil, etc. Well, butrin. Dopamine, cocaine. Endorphin, opium, morphine, heroin, Demerol, fentanyl, all the opiate drugs. Norepinephrine, methamphetamine, ecstasy, mescaline, Effexor. Acetylcholine, nicotine. Those of you who worship the nicotine god, or the tobacco god, whether by chewing or smoking. Anandamide, marijuana and chocolate. The analogs for that. Phenylethylamine is also in chocolate. Testosterone in anabolic steroids. Estrogen in certain plant substances. And GABA, which is uh, affected by alcohol. GHB is a date rape drug and volatile inhalants like uh, paint and glue. So for example, taking one of them, ser serotonin transmission. So neurochemicals are essentially the vocabulary of your cells. Each neurotransmitter is like a word, and the same word can mean different things depending on where or how it's used. So some neurotransmitters do double, triple, or even quadruple duty, depending on what the circumstances are. And in fact, after the word is given, that is the neurotransmitter is transmitted, either, either eaten by an enzyme and deactivated or brought back into a cell in a process called reuptake. So SSRIs, serum serotonin reuptake inhibitors, are drugs that affect serotonin levels by suppressing the reuptake process so that more serotonin is involved in uh, the synapse of the nerves and basically what serotonin does in this particular effect is it screens out data flow so that you suppress more data flow. LSD is like the opposite of Prozac or Paxil where it competes with serotonin for receptor sites and therefore more data comes flooding in to your sensorium and you attempt to slot that data into uh, convenient packages except the end. so the walls seem to be breathing and you see trailers and all these other things that are normal functions of your brain but are usually suppressed by normal serotonin levels. Serotonin regulates, of course, body temperature, sexual response, general arousal, and amount of sensory data so that when you see the side effects list or you hear the side effects list of Wellbutrin and Paxil when they talk about sexual side effects or may cause suicide in adolescence, this is basically because of affecting serotonin levels, among other things. So as an example, uh, this slide basically talks about 
dopamine and opiate receptors and reuptake. And so oftentimes, affecting one neurotransmitter will affect the levels of the others, particularly if that neurotransmitter is involved with alleviating pain. So alleviating pain causes pleasure, so an endorphin slotting into a receptor site causes pleasure, and pleasure is also basically involved with dopamine, dopamine's involved with pleasure, so one use of one drug will often, or substance will often induce um, different experiences, different levels with others, so pretty much any addictive drug will often affect dopamine levels and things like cocaine affect dopamine directly. So all of these have a, uh, an effect uh, beyond just the simple ingestion of them. So in terms, to further illustrate brain neurochemistry, on the left, on your screen left, you have the chemical uh, anandamide, which is made in your brain, and on the right you have THC, which is the active, one of the active ingredients in marijuana. So one of the things you see with that, even though they're not identical, they're somewhat similar. So as an example, cannabis sativa does not make THC to get people stoned. Essentially what it does is it uses THC as a fungicide. Make cannabinoids as a defense against fungus and mold in tropical areas. And so what it does is a plants can't run away from their enemies. So what they do do is make themselves less attractive or less um, uh, vulnerable to uh, other plants, mold, uh, or other animals. So for example, if you eat hot peppers, hot peppers are a defense against mammals so that mammals won't eat the seeds and birds will. So particularly in the marijuana plant or the cannabis sativa plant, it seeks to protect leaves, flowers, and seeds, hence the concentration of those uh, substances in the area of the plant. So THC resembles a neurotransmitter, a nondamide, a section of it. So strictly speaking, there aren't THC receptors as the slide talks about, but there are anandamide receptors. And in addition, what it's not necessarily showing here is that THC also lodges within the cell walls so that the cells itself can be temp made uh, up to 30% less efficient because uh, that section of membrane that the THC is lodging in becomes unable to bring in nutrients. Now, it's not enough to kill the cell, generally speaking, but depending on what the cell is, whether it's a uh, leukocyte, like a white blood cell, that's basically, essentially, when you get stoned, it's not just your brain that's getting stoned, it's also your immune system that's getting stoned as well, because THC lodges in the fat of all cells, not just fat cells, but all cells have fat in them. So, potentially, uh, for, make, for reducing the cellular efficiency of all cells, but particularly ones that are high traffic, so to speak. So in terms of neurochemistry, anandamide is involved with diverse areas such as pain perception, balance, coordination, sensory input, movement, judgment. Uh, all those are targeted by this particular neurotransmitter and so naturally then they would also be affected by marijuana use. So you can basically look at in terms of where, where marijuana is used in medicine, and it was a legal drug up until 1938. Uh, so it, ha it has been used in the U.S. pharmacopoeia up until that point, as well as cultures of tradition like Egypt and uh, China, as well as other places where uh, Western medicine hadn't uh, been developed yet or is in the process of developing. So in it, again, there's a reason why THC works, and uh, the brain neurochemistry is part of how that works. So like opiates, anandamide doesn't stop pain, it just deals, enables you to deal with it emotionally. So naturally, since it produces pleasure, it's, as part of its effect, it is involved with brain reward. So a section of the THC resembles anandamide, but it doesn't have to be an exact match, and so 
one of the things that happens, like with, for example, with endorphin, means warfarin within, even though your body makes it, and not a plant, opiates slot right into your endorphin uh, receptor sites as anandamide, uh, rather THC slots imperfectly into your anandamide receptor sites as well as all over the place. So anandamide is also closely related to endorphin receptors, leading at least one pharmaceutical company to make an opiate addiction treatment drug based on the cannabis genome using uh, anandamide pathways. So it has been told me, I'm not sure whether this is accurate, so I have to be checked out, but Suboxone does uh, combine buprenorphine with an opiate antagonist, naloxone, so that while providing relief from withdrawal, it also prevents re-addiction in case of relapse, because if you use on top of it, it, the opiate doesn't work because it has been blocked by that particular part of the drug. So often uh, I do a THC quick kit because this drug, for example, is fairly subtle because people think it's not addicting, but anything that causes pleasure, when you stop using it, that causes a withdrawal syndrome is by definition addicting. So as an example, uh, this is, a, we'll finish out with the THC quick kit. This is anandamide, it's made in your brain. This is THC, it lessens your pain. So anandamide, like other neurotransmitters, has its own receptor sites in your brain that fit it like a lock and key. Part of that molecule fits in anandamide receptor sites in your nervous system, producing similar effects to anandamide. So marijuana withdrawal syndrome started being described in the literature, in the overseas literature in the early 80s. So part of that syndrome that the literature described was increased irritability, REM rebound, meaning you're able to remember your dreams, dysphoria, meaning you don't feel good, dysphoria, as opposite of euphoria, and then craving. So craving is like persistent thoughts and desires for the drug. So in high doses, you would find more dramatic withdrawal syndromes like shakes, nausea, pain, hypersensitivity. So most people, and where I basically found the breaking point of that was um, below an eighth of an ounce a day, you would experience increased irritability, REM rebound, dysphoria, craving, but above an eighth of an ounce a day, you basically could develop shakes, nausea, pain, up to a person that I knew that was smoking a quarter to an ounce a day, he was a grower. So having high-grade high sens sensimia and essentially chain-smoking 40 joints in a day, which is like two, two packs of cigarettes, he, after three days, had shakes, uh, couldn't sleep, uh, was having cramping, kind of like um, opiate withdrawal. Now, that's rare, but I have encountered people that have had those intense um, high-dose high withdrawal syndromes somewhere above an eighth to a quarter a day. Uh, but obviously that's a fairly expensive habit too. So marijuana withdrawal syndrome. So your body, in, re in response to the presence of a drug, creates more receptor sites to handle the increased load of uh, simulated, uh, simulated uh, neurotransmitter analog. This is one mechanism of what's called tolerance. And your withdrawal then comes from a lack of either the neurotransmitter or chemical stimulus in the form of the drug to fill in the receptors, and so you experience withdrawal. So marijuana treatment, so for example, this is the 12 questions of Marijuana Anonymous. Has smoking pot stopped being fun? You ever get high alone? This is hard to imagine a life without marijuana. Do you find your friends are determined by your marijuana use? Do you smoke marijuana to avoid dealing with your problems? Do you smoke pot to cope with your feelings, etc.? Um, this is one model that we use within the recovery center, uh, but there are other ones that are more scientifically based. This is essentially a model after the 12-step uh, program, 12 questions of marijuana anonymous. So one of the ways that, you know, in terms of, uh, you can develop this particular protocol for any drug withdrawal. I'm using this for marijuana to examine, basically to 
promote the idea that any drug that you withdraw from has a different withdrawal period. So THC has a seven day half-life. So there are four half-life periods within a drug, therefore your detox with marijuana can be up to 28 days to detox the last dose that you did. So you want to allow about three continuous months of abstinence to allow mind-body rebalancing. So the fact that somebody might be proud of not having smoked in a month, that's not enough. You basically just detox the last dose, so one month is nothing. So the Harris detox rule of thumb is basically uh, for marijuana. It's six months without, if you can basically not use for six months, and after six months you don't care that you haven't used six months, it probably was not a problem for you. But the idea is this, you have to at least not smoke pot for six months, minimum. Okay? Minimum. So one to seven days. So in one to seven days what you'll experience is irritability, REM rebound, dysphoria, and high dose those severe symptoms that we talked about, nausea and shakes. But below, say, an eighth of an ounce a day, roughly, you know, irritability, REM rebound, it's in dysphoria, which you know, most people think compared to heroin, this is nothing, but you know, it can be very irritating if it's you going through that. Seven to 14 days, you'll see an immune system rebound where all of a sudden you might develop a cold or get sick because your immune system cells are waking up and start attacking the bacteria that they ignored while they were stoned, or while you were stoned. So you'll experience uh, colds or coughing. 14 to 21 days, Basically, you'll experience head or body rushes, and actually you can experience these anytime uh, at, during the withdrawal period, but they can be more pronounced in this 14 to 21 day period. And 21 to 28 days, basically you can also have euphoric recall dreams where you're basically you know, smoking pot in your dreams and feeling like you're stoned even though you haven't used anything. So, uh, the withdrawal period is not just physical, it's also mental and emotional because anandamide as a chemical substance is involved with all these different things that have emotional qualities to it and of course someone, uh, drug addiction, uh, and you know, marijuana is a drug and it is an addicting drug because you develop tolerance and therefore withdrawal when you stop using as much as your tolerance has allowed you for. So, uh, a minimum detox is 28 days, and I recommend a period of at least six months to a year for complete recovery. So, that, again, what you can expect in the first week, irritability, REM rebound, dysphoria, headaches, transient minor pain, and high dose severe symptoms if your daily intake was between an eighth to an ounce a day, shakes, nausea, pain, hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity is simply um, things seem louder, things seem brighter, skin sensitivity, a number of different things. Highly variable. Seven to 14 days, immune system rebound colds, sore throat, coughing, and as THC clears from the system naturally, the immune system cells wake up, begin fighting bacteria again, and they were of course stoned too. You might experience this as a healing crisis in the form of colds or coughing. It's part of your body's natural recovery process. You can assist it with more liquids, vitamin C, B complex, CalMag zinc, 14 to 21 days, head and body rushes. At the, this point, you might begin to experience some early clarity of mind here. You ain't done yet. Stay the course. You might experience transient sensations of being high, especially when you stand up suddenly. It's just more latent THC being released into your system uh, because of the um, saturation effect. Osmosis. 
21 to 28 days euphoric recall dreams. So it's actually possible to experience using dreams before this, but this is not unheard of during this stage. And this is really the first ma major milestone within THC withdrawal uh, one month. So you'll need about three consecutive months strung together to return to mind, body, normal. The normal is in quotes because it's a new normal because you exposed your system uh, to drugs. And from the brain's point of view, any drug use uh, that's non-prescribed that gets you high is the equivalent of having a safe dropped on your head from two-story building um, because it's a pretty profound effect on the nervous system. So if you were to use again, you'd very quickly return to your original tolerance because the brain is the, and, and nervous system are designed to adapt, and they do. So this presentation was really designed to be self-guiding on the net, so in no way is it suggested that you attempt to do this on your own, uh, but unless you have sufficient inner resources to do so. And don't blame yourself, because we don't often give up, uh, and we give up a lot to be civilized. So some of what we gave up was inner discipline. So to help you, we also recommend the following. The herbal teas, uh, this is for specifically for marijuana. Addiction, the herbal teas go to cola and ginkgo biloba, sigla, or in combination, have been useful. Don't overdo them. Use them as a brain tonic. Uh, B vitamins and other brain boosting minerals, CalMag, zinc, potassium. Uh, meditation or other mind calming techniques are useful focusing tools. So, this kind of con concludes uh, our talk on. Uh, beyond the field with covering some of the major drugs of abuse uh, that athletes often encounter. We haven't really talked about steroids in particular, but um, our office uh, is maintained as a resource. We're in building one, room 226, uh, five days a week, nine to five. Thank you for your attention. Go well, stay well, stay strong.